today I am presenting on uh, remote collaboration, my experience uh, with that when I was, I started as a geek just in my bedroom and I just like, it was like, hey, one day I'm like, hey, I want to just make some mods. And so I just went on a bunch of forums and like I just pulled together whatever information was on the internet and like it just took me down this long road until like I got all the way to people that just were suddenly in the industry. So I wanted to start with a video that I remember watching uh, a few years ago and of course it's going to play an ad so I'll see if I can uh, momentarily mute it while that goes and I'll talk while that's happening. So. Um, these were, uh, this is a guy, these are two musicians that just like met each other through the internet and decided that they were going to like talk long enough that they would learn to play Hotel California together like from one guy's in the Netherlands, one guy's in the U.S. Um, is, is that advertising? No, no, no. It's, it's fine. It's there we go. Ah, uh, my name is Bastian and I'm from the Netherlands and I'm from Europe. He's like super boring. Yeah, we made a video of uh, Hotel California by Eagles. And next to commenting on this, which we really want to read, we would also like you to share our video with all the other YouTubers. Okay, Jimmy, can you share that again? It's over here. Right. So these guys ended up getting 7 million video uh, hits, and they got all kinds of letters and feedback, and just like a lot of just praise for what they did. Um, I guess they composited all this other kind of stuff. Uh, and um, it's, it's pretty kick ass. Um, it's all it comes down to. But I definitely have more to this talk than just this video. So um, maybe we can go back. But yeah, these guys ended up uh, basically, um, they ended up uh, like, and working together further. They, I, I went to that guy's website just today, like looking for this video. Of course, it was impossible to find on YouTube. Um, but yeah, they did a Stairway to Heaven video. Um, and I guess they're still working together because of all that experience. So uh, that's sort of the segue. Um, that's that guy's website. Um, so what is remote collaboration? So I wrote it in pseudocode. Well, not face to face, work on shared goals. Um, pretty simple. Um, and so this talk is going to try and emphasize uh, the sort of instances where remote collaboration takes place, uh, as well as sort of like what challenges could be, um, and then what you know ways that uh, these challenges can be uh, mitigated or uh, mediated, um, and then why this actually could be relevant to today. Um, and so a picture of a giant globe there, I'll sort of go into, but of course, one of the things that we can think of is people working from every corner of the globe uh, all at once. This applies to uh, a lot of different industries. Um, and sort of, we'll talk about the challenges, for instance, how do you get people working from all different time zones? So <coughs> when one person's sleeping and the other person's awake and working, how do you get those people managed together? Um, so the challenges are certainly keeping tabs, knowing that uh, all the workers are sort of on the same page with what's going on. Um, you might have the, the, like, the event where like two, two people set off on like one shared goal. They go to separate rooms or you know, in this case, like whatever room they're in in whatever part of the globe, they work on what they're working on. Like say like could be two days or two weeks later, they come back together, have they sort of arrived at the same point. Um, making sure that that sort, of, that sort of collaboration keeps up. And then also, you know, there might be times where you have a conflict. Maybe someone doesn't really, uh, is, is having, having trouble and you expect them to kind of uh, sort of finish or just everything to go smoothly, but it doesn't. Um, these are the kind of things that if you're in an office environment, you can readily know when that sort of is not happening because you sort of keep contact much quicker. Um, but especially when you're working remotely, there's much, it's much easier to hide almost. Um, so uh, I guess I wanted to start out because, of course, uh, where most of my experience was in games, um, this is CryEngine, which is one of the like, leading companies in games. And this is a pretty prime example of something that was developed purely remotely. Um, these guys were Finnish. I, I'm pretty sure they were Finnish. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know the full story of how they did it, but they did build this entire engine um, remotely. and. Um, this is sort of extended into their, their newer products, which now are definitely on the leading edge. And like this is really 
uh, cutting edge stuff. So one of the things that I found doing remote collaboration is you get to meet people of like skill sets that are very specific and also at the top of their, their game because you're sort of drawing from a global pile rather than like um, you know something where it's harder to find people that are exactly around you that do exactly what you do if you are doing something that as obscure as some of um, the items in, for instance, games can be. Um, so how, how do they end up like actually working together remotely on something of this scale and actually like keeping the pace? And so one of the answers is something that you see all over the place, uh, which is like ticket tracking and project management that's sort of using online systems. And they use this internal to companies as well. So I thought we'd look a little bit at WordPress's uh, track page, which is gigantic. Um, and then this is a little bit different. So this is sort of, this is WordPress, which is an open source project, and this is a little bit different because it's more like anybody can sort of jump on here and start contributing these tickets. Um, so like, I guess if we hop in one, you'll probably see there's a bunch of comments, there's an outline of the bug. Um, but this is an idea of how you take a bunch of small little tickets and then um, typically how tracker systems work is you then organize tickets into, uh, we can look at the fields up top, you have components, priority, then you organize them all into milestones. And so a bunch of tickets comprise a milestone and that's sort of where you can also keep pace of who's working on what. Um, that's sort of one way that you can begin to organize uh, working remotely. Whereas you can picture working side by side, you sort of say, hey, what are you working on? Hey, what are you working on? You don't really need a system like this. In fact, I've seen instances where you try and put people that are working face to face on a ticket tracker, they get really frustrated because they sort of don't see the purpose of why are we doing this. Um, so, moving forward, moving along. Welcome to a tutorial on how to set up and uh, use. So, um, the question then becomes, well, how do we actually start to get people to work together um, in such a way that maybe is less like, well, has the elements of WordPress where it is organizing that overall vision and uh, destination, but it's also allowing people to sort of regain that face-to-face -face interaction. And so a, a pretty easy way I can sort of point to how, where, where would one start to look to to see how this is done successfully, and a pretty readily available example is World of Warcraft. You look at how any World of Warcraft players sort of work together and communicate, uh, I think that's a pretty great starting point to say, how can people do this? And one of the tools that they end up using and that we ended up using a lot in games was Ventrilo. You'd literally have chat rooms of people that sort of use their mic chat, and these are people from, again, all over the globe, and they sort of like ping each other. They'll just say like, hey, this is what I'm working on currently, or they'll just idle in a channel similar to a program like IRC. Um, and so, that sort of ends up looking some sound. You like hit that and you won't be able to hear anyone talking. If you mute the mic. And that's, yeah. And so um, it's just a pretty simple so like push to talk system. So um, you can see they kind of organize it into like channels and so forth. Um, it's the kind of thing like when we were working in games, you had artists, you had developers. You could sort of segment by the team, like what almost departments is kind of what it was doing. But of course, I think in many instances, because we were just bunch of people enthusiastic we didn't really know that we were you know mimicking what you know what might be like business structures we were just doing it because it made sense um, so that's sort of one example of how it can start to be organized that way oh, that's horrible I'm sorry but then of course the other thing is that you have I mean it's so popular like a program like that and people use it so much that then they make all sorts of series of Star Wars harassment videos where they take sound clips from Darth Vader and Chewbacca and harass people on Venture Low. Um, so this was um, now sort of going from, so we looked at CryEngine which was a sort of corporate example. Um, this is an example of a uh, now game company, but started as just a bunch of people in their bedrooms or wherever they were, people that worked at a company and said, this is kind of boring, I want to do stuff during the evenings. Um, and they sort of worked together on this game called Insurgency. Um, and that ended up sort of being taken off and started as a company. Um, so, so, right. And so what that game sort of did was it took, and what I was going to show here was that it sort of made a few firsts for its industry. This was the first game to detail the Iraq War. 
um, like before any like out there in the games industry. Um, and so what I'm going to show here is this is this is the live gameplay. This was made by people that were just sort of not being paid to do what they did. Um, these were just people that were interacting on systems like the the track ticket system on Ventrilo on uh, like AOL Instant Messenger, and that's pretty much the only way they were communicating, um, just using these kind of tools, and, and then forum software as well, just literally sharing kind of like screenshots of, hey, this is what I'm working on, and you'd sort of see them do this, and you'd be like, whoa, that's cool, and you'd kind of get a, a, a kick of like, like, like excitement, and then you'd want to sort of produce and give back to it as well, and you'd kind of kick up your own development. Um, so that's kind of how a lot of that ended up working. And so if we compare it to another game that came out around that is exactly well. Yeah, if we could turn down the volume. Um, so yeah, if you look at the graphics for Modern Warfare, which came out around the time, I mean, they're similar. Like this is, and so it really just shows that a bunch of guys just like doing this for fun can end up making something that like looks industry quality. Um, this game actually, Call of Duty came out after, uh, after Insurgency did. How do I go back? Uh, there we go. Um, no, that's um, okay, so like, w if we were to outline the tools so far, uh, we have ticket trackers, version control, voice chat, um, getting completely different time zones together. How did that end up working out? Typically, you'd kind of like, when we were sort of trying to organize uh, that company, because that's where I sort of worked for a time, um, you kind of we try to designate you have time zone leaders or another, so like you kind of have people that, you have the Europe, Europeans, you have the people working in Asia, um, and so you try and coordinate it so you kind of know these people are online at this time. Um, you would get a lot of people that sort of overlap, like they'll stay up really ridiculous hours. Um, but I think one way to kind of manage it is to almost designate a, a leader in a, any given time zone. So they are the one that's sort of keeping pace with the rest of the managing team to sort of be like, okay, this is where progress is at. That makes sure that sort of that cohesion stays uh, built and kept together. Um, and then sort of working at a uh, different scale. So like there are ways to actually like make it kind of feel like the way that I think about it is it's like it's almost like an extension of if you're working with the person face to face but using these tools to do it. Um, and so like another tool, oh, and so I guess, um, so like, yes, so about that working from home thing. Um, so and that's just saying, yeah, again, it's like having seen other people produce this stuff is really an awesome like kick to enthusiasm. And I think the other thing that remote collaboration does uh, is like, Sometimes, like if you're working face to face, people, it's almost like you. There's a tendency for unnecessary things that have nothing to do with what's being worked on gets brought to the table. Like um, you work in an office, you have stuff like your manager or your boss come over and be like, and hover over you and be like, "Oh, what are you working on?" And suddenly you're like, "Whoa!" And you sort of like get all like, it almost like it ruins your chi a little bit. And it's like. Um, those are the kind of things where like, or people don't want to be at the office, or this and that. It's the kind of thing if you're doing it remotely, you kind of only interact with people um, like when you really want to. Um, one of the things I was going to try and mention about the ventrilo is you literally only talk, or other people can hear you only when you push to talk. So it's like you kind of, it's a really small design item, but it's like your microphone only works when you have something to say, when you deliberately hit the button. So it's, it's small things like that that I think make it an environment where it's much more like an opt-in rather than like you're forced to be there for work. Um, but again, that's sort of in lieu of all the challenges of keeping tabs and making sure people are on the same page. Um, and I was gonna mention, this is a guy, Joel on Software, which is like a pretty well-known guy. Let's see if that's open, I'm sure he did. Yeah. And so with Joel and Software, he's like a super well-known guy. He sort of co-authored Stack Overflow. Um, he talks about how, and he says that they did this in Microsoft. He worked at Microsoft and then wrote his own book and then started his own company and did Stack Overflow. And he talks about how like all programmers like must have private offices and how like because programmers have this thing where they get into the zone. Um, and it's like when you're working in cubicles or open office space, it's just it's just it's just not how programming works. Um, and so like that's an example of someone documenting kind of a 
similar benefit that you would end up seeing with remote collaboration. Um, and so we'll go a little bit further into some of those like outside uh, industries that sort of like look at this kind of thing as well. Um, wanted to also introduce another tool, uh, which is whiteboarding. I'll have to log in on that one. Uh, so this this is something I pulled up from, you can see, two years ago is when it was uh, worked on. And, uh, and so this is literally like what we were doing when we were working uh, on like planning for this company. Did that open? Uh, yeah, sure. And like this is, so this is literally like we would just sit in this thing like at each of our respective computers and just draw. And like it's kind of cool because it's kind of like a whiteboard. And that's obviously, I guess, um, what is thought of with a typical programming planning environment is that you first, you just get on a big whiteboard and you sort of, you're like, what are we doing here? But there are online tools that sort of replicate all of these processes. There's all sorts of like BS shareholder like discussion and stuff. Um, so like that's yet other tool. And the idea is that for anything that, that is done face to face, likely there's a tool that's sitting online that sort of facilitates the same thing. Um, and so other tools, and these are ones that I haven't personally used, but it's like you can imagine that the new Google like Plus Hangouts are pretty good. Like if you just get people on like a webcam. Um, and obviously each has like a, you know, its own kind of uh, circumstance where that would work. Um, and so obviously that adds to our arsenal of tools that can be used. Um, and then, yes, remember Google Wave, and it, and it really was, it really did look like this incredible tool for embedding everything and like kind of getting, almost making conversation just feel completely natural online. And then it got abandoned. Um, and I think that it almost it almost typifies how like industry is not yet ready to handle like this idea of almost people being completely immersed on their computers and working completely through their computers. And that's something probably I'll, I put later in the slides, but just I'll mention it now is it's like one of the other things that I think the benefit of like working like remote on remote collaboration basis is that it's like if you're already doing work on the computer getting up and going to talk to someone almost like disrupts like your ability to focus. So, but if you're on the computer and you're, you're working and you're communicating with others through the computer, it's almost like you can almost build that, that, that rhythm that is required to kind of do some of this very specific work. Um, I think that Google Wave, I mean, obviously they took a lot of the same product and then they just ended up putting it into their other already used uh, product line, but it's sort of an example of, of how maybe that didn't take off. Um, and so here's an example of now, and so now we're sort of going into, we sort of mentioned the Jawan software, which is a sort of just a guy that was pretty well known that sort of mentioned this kind of thing. Now, looking at IBM, like they specifically bought space in Second Life. Have any of you played Second Life? So, and I have no idea why, like I don't get it, but like they did, and they did it specifically to, uh, that guy's name is a bit field too, that's interesting. <laughs> um, they did it specifically uh, like so they could like test out remote collaboration. Like they had like these people sitting in office chairs, like, <laughs> and, like and I guess like, and then it looks like they, they segment into like different industries down here. <laughs> And I don't, I, yeah, and I, get, I, I really think they spent millions of dollars for an, an island in this thing. Um, and this is when I was like, I was up going to, to Marist College in Poughkeepsie, it was like right down the road from where they were doing all this stuff. The only woman uh, professor uh, like there on like a grant money was working on this kind of stuff. What she wanted to do was she wanted, so her premise was it's like, if you got, researchers working together remotely and you've got it done effectively, like you no longer need to put the top leading scientists in the world in a room together to have them actually like produce something. Like you can put the top minds together, make them actually feel like they're in a lab and suddenly like, like the benefit of this becomes clear. One of the things that she found in her research was it doesn't need to like look hyper realistic, but it just needs to feel real. Um, so again, I think that kind of can go back to where like if you use tools like Ventrilo or like just the 
face-to-face -face thing. You just, so long as you mimic a little bit of that interaction, I think there's a lot of negatives that actually get, you get rid of in the process. Um, so that's an example of like IBM. And then the other thing, this is really purely anecdotal. I don't really know how to back this up. I think my landlord told me who worked for the Coast Guard, he says, some government agencies now use only four day work weeks with one day purely designated as remote commute. Um, and this is something they've done to save on transportation. Um, the idea that they don't want the road systems to be used as much. Um, the idea that it, you know, it's just, it's the right idea. Um, I, I don't think we hear a lot about it like taking off or there's not a lot of um, super creative output coming from these kind of things or maybe, maybe it is there. Um, but it's definitely clear why we should think about these things. Um, we could turn this into like even a national security issue. Um, so maybe you recognize these pictures of being on a crowded metro at rush hour. Um, or then the other picture would be that we are the, like, the biggest consumer of, I think that's barrels of oil per year. Um, and it's all just done driving. And then the, the one piece of evidence they found online just doing a Google search was just, um, we spend more time commuting than vacationing in a given year. So more times than a two week vacation would give. Um, and then I, and, and, and I'm just a person, that I'm actually kind of new to even riding the metro. It just seems like there's a lot of people that, no one wants to do that. Like people would much rather like work on what they want to work on. And then, and then it's, it's going alongside and saying that this isn't really for every industry. These, these is definitely for the intangible kinds of industries where um, the, the product is not like a manufactured product or um, something that really requires to be there on site. Um, but uh, so, so that's basically the, the, the bulk of the presentation. Uh, the takeaways that I think are for this um, is that, yeah, definitely being not really leaving the computer allows you, like I know when I was like programming games, the, the only reason I was able to do it was because I was able to sit there for hours and just like glue myself to this thing. And, and as soon as I left that and tried to find like the same thing elsewhere, I just never found it. I never did. And I think it was because like I was able to sit there and not only that, but I was able to feel like a little bit socially engaged, like just enough so like I didn't have to leave my bedroom um, and like see what others were producing uh, like I was and just like get that, just that hype kick of like, wow, this is cool. Um, Obviously, we've become more invested in the internet, so it kind of makes sense that, like, why would we detach from it, um, and like, why would we, why would we not rethink uh, the way that we do things in conjunction with our investment into something new like that? Um, and then I think the other idea is that maybe it's a little bit even more of a, a shift in thinking is that maybe we don't even have to. We could work on many things at once. I mean, there's plenty of places they sort of loosely talk about this stuff, but um, it's not the kind of thing where we see a lot of adoption. Like, uh, they'll say like people have like multiple career changes rather than multiple job changes in a lifetime now. And, um, they'll say like, you know, uh, whether it's commerce or any kind of idea that comes from many parts of the global at once. Um, and then obviously <laughs> you could just sort of point to the economy if our generation's not really work. I mean, you can imagine that people are even more, only going to become even more connected to the internet. So um, I guess I was really giving this presentation in context of, I guess, how do you manage it? I, I think being a person that went from all of this stuff in games and then being frustrated because I could never find it, I could never get a job that seemed like that cool. Like even when I worked at that startup with like taking the insurgency scheme, I really was like, we should just use what worked here. But because there's this immense pressure to do things the old way, you definitely, um, this was the guy that was sort of the um, the brainchild of this this thing. Like he definitely wanted to just pursue capital. He wanted to just get a bunch of investment money. He wanted to you know get an office space. Like and I remember just sitting there and like it's two rooms and uh, like like so we're sort of maybe 10, 15 feet apart. And every time we would speak, he just wanted me to like wheel around and just talk together. And I was like, no, dude, just I am me or something. He thought that was the most awkward thing in the world. He was like, why don't I just talk to you? And I think it was because of that, what the Joel on software thing is, it's like having just that ability to, to gain that kind of focus to do that kind of really um, like in-depth work that does intimately use the computer. Um, I think it has a lot of value. 
Um, so I, and I think the other benefit is from from trying to work purely remotely like that is that you can you can start recruiting talent from anywhere in the world, and that's just the nature of it. You don't really have to make people come to you. You just sort of let them plug in where they want. And I think further, if you use tools like Ventrilo and all these other things, you can kind of maybe get something a little bit more than just a, a, a volunteer basis that you might see with a system like WordPress. So um, that is basically all I have today. Thank you. Uh, any questions? I think I remember <laughs> I looked up the some software, um, some not specifically a software, but a website where you can actually, it's like a platform where you can find graphic designers or computer scientists all over, people, whatever you need, and just like one website and you can like build up, let's say, your own company. Just check it out, it's pretty cool. There are tons of websites.